This is Annabelle Guberti and you are listening to Lawfully Creative, my podcast to talk with professionals in the creative industries, to hear their stories, what inspires their creation, what decisions change their careers, what relationships influence their work. Today's episode is brought to you by Crefovi, our London and Paris-based law firm focused on advising the creative industries. Subscribe to our podcast, Lawfully Creative, or catch up with our original shows on iTunes, Spotify, Deezer, Stitcher, YouTube, Anchor, and many more podcast aggregators and platforms. Please do leave a review and rating about our podcast to encourage others to discover our curated content. Thank you. Hi, Annabelle. Hi. Hi. Can you say me? You have grown your hair, I was saying. No, this is short. I, I've had it down to here, the first part yeah. of lockdown. <laughs> and I went, from being, I yeah. went from being from Paul Weller to, uh, <laughs> to Peter Stringfellow, so I've had to cut it again, yeah. Good for you. I, I've got some uh, long hair myself, but uh, I've just stepped up of, um, of my shower, so it's okay. all wet, so that's why it's in a bun. So I discovered, you know, because I never Googled you, to be honest. Sorry, yeah. it's not a lack of curiosity, but I used to, you know, uh, catch up with you from time to time, face to face. So I never had a thinking of Googling you. But when you asked me, did you mind just sending me a list of questions that you would like to ask me? I Googled you. And so I came across this fantastic picture of you on a, um, on a scooter, of course, because I know yeah. you love scooters. Yeah. Uh, wearing a very smart suit in the middle of, I don't know, is it Wyoming or something? Uh, it's uh, Mon Monument Valley. Monument. <laughs> and it's, it says, Malcolm Garskin, advertising legend. D do you mind explaining what is the uh, history of his picture? Because it looks really great. <laughs> uh, now, what, the, what that was for was for Direction magazine, okay. which is like a sort of glossy color picture thing for a uh, for, uh, campaign sort of thing. And uh, the, the, the photographer, who quite well known, he was doing, he was tasked to take different advertising legends and take pictures of them and e explain who they are, you know, like John Egerty, Kate Stanners, and Graham Fink. And he's a bit of a surrealist. He, uh, that was taken in Putney. I thought, okay, so this is a more. My, my scooter, my clothes, he just dropped that in the background. That, okay, he, yeah, he's he just awesome. Because he. Because he knew then people would look at it. He was a fantastic guy, yeah. And yeah, and you look so serious on this picture. I mean, you yeah. you, you really do look like a wise guy, actually. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so anyway, it was it was a, it was a Oswald Bateng suit, so it was pretty good, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And so therefore, you say it was actually then published in this um, in this. Yeah, it was, it was for a big exhibition and some of the magazines. Yeah. Okay. So I probably will actually take this picture later on to for the uh, for the little uh, widget. Um, okay. Cool. So I also when I googled you, Malcolm, I also saw that um, there were a few articles about you in. Um, Campaign Live and uh, and yeah, exactly. CampaignLive.com. Uh, so, is is my understanding correct that this is like a, a, a trade magazine for the advertising? Uh, campaign is like the Financial Times for advertising people. Yeah, it's all about the business, all about the people. Uh, and like in America, I have a thing called Ad Age, and I, I'm trying to remember the French one. But uh, each country has its own sort of magazine about. What's going on? Britain had two of them, two magazines, uh, Ad Week and uh, Campaign, and Campaign's digital now. Uh, and and because book. because and there were weeklies, you know, there's a lot a lot of turnover. People get fired, people getting hired, parties, new work. Uh, uh, it's a lot. So it's actually treated like a business magazine, but also like a showbiz magazine. So it's pretty. A good showbiz magazine. magazine. Wow. Okay. And it was it, it all and it was all sold in. Soho, so it was next to all the ah. showbiz mags and the Vogue and all that kind of stuff. So, so thank that, you. That's how it was. Thank you for uh, explaining the campaign is. So, yeah, I'm uh, sorry, unfortunately, it went digital about it's great four years, four years ago. It was a brilliant, brilliant magazine yeah. uh, because you prefer to read it on the like as in the hard copy. Uh, I prefer because, like, uh, you know, I've got a few that I kept with where I was in or I did, did okay. over, over the years, but well, you know, I, Nobody's got that anymore, have they? 
No. And, and to be honest, especially with a, a COVID-19 crisis. Uh, but to be honest, I mean, to Google you, I'm glad that they also have a, uh, you know, a, 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 an online site. So I, I quote from campaign, um, Malcolm Gaskin and John Kelly, top creatives preparing for O&M Falls Challenge. Yeah. Um, so Malcolm Gaskin and John Kelly are optimistic about the job. And I think there's another one which says actually um, that you are a veteran creative pair. The yeah. two so anyway. so we weren't, weren't a pair. We weren't a pair. In advertising, when uh -huh. you get to, as a creative person, once you, when you get about 35, 35 years old, you're, you're more or less a veteran, yeah? <laughs> Re really, really. You're a veteran at 35. If you manage to get past 40, you're like a states person. Uh, and then nobody, nobody after forty. But how do you explain that? Is it because it's such a high turnover rate? High ch turnover, high b burnout. Uh, high burnout. Mm. Uh, cause, cause you work them seven days a week. Yeah. As a as a as a well known creative director said, if you don't come in on Saturday, don't bother coming on Sunday. Yeah. <laughs> so you just work seven days a week, usually from be a creator from about ten o'clock to about eight o'clock at night. night. And then at least every other weekend you're working on a pitch or yeah, yeah. Or, or you're off on a shoot somewhere, you know. I mean, yeah. So, For me, it's like but, business as usual, but, but yeah. okay. But, you're, but you're, you guys are time by the hour, so hours means... No, it's not true. I mean, yes, but when you have your own law firm, yeah, yeah. Um, Malcolm, you also have to do all the, you know, SEO at the weekend. You also have to, to work on your website at the weekend, redo yeah. the terms and conditions, because you can't do that during the week because you are actually doing some business yeah. development or, yeah, yeah. so... Yeah, yeah. So, 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 so it's, a, it's a high burnout and very uh, everything's you're pitching all the time. Like, bit like it's very even if you've got a long term contract with a client, yeah. you never can trust they're going to move. When I start the business, I think clients would move every three years. Oh, so by they basically time. just give you some very by short contracts so that you're always yeah, on your the, on edge. By the time I finish, it's about eighteen months. Uh, and now I would say in the new digital age. Yeah. People don't really have contracts, have a project contract. Right. Even That's from really massive right. big companies like uh, a car company. So John Kelly, who was a very well-known guy originally from working in CDP, he was creative director and European director of Ford at Ogilvy and being made there. Another guy who was ex-BMC, BMP, Patrick Collister, was the UK uh, creative director. And Ford was having trouble just cyclically because their cars were this is Ford UK right this is Ford UK but I was coming into Ford Europe and beyond yeah okay and they were going through a cyclical problem where the cars were the shapes of the cars were a bit tired mm. and they didn't have a full set of new ones a bit like going from a Volkswagen Beetle to a Golf yeah in this sort of in between business and so people are starting to buy alter other people's cars yeah yeah. So a car, a car can't, company can't suddenly invent a whole new fleet of cars overnight because they just don't have the throughput. It's not like America where they, they change the car shape every two years. Yeah. In Europe, it was every five, ten years, and you, you milk it and you stretch it and you sure. re, re budget, but you, you don't change the platform for about ten or so. It was one of those ones, yeah? And unfortunately, the agency, Ogilvy, uh, had moved from the centre of London, uh, which was... Um, uh, off on the strand, and the movie uh, came out. Oh, my name is Julian Mather. Oh, 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 really yeah, Ogilvy and Mather. Yeah, it's famous. Julian Mather, Mather. And uh, they'd moved from there to there. And when they got to Canary Wharf, it was a desert, yeah. a windy, damp desert with hardly any high rise. When was that? Was that in the early? That was in the eighties, early eighties. Right. Uh, and uh, all the people that were there, nobody wanted to work there because you never saw anybody. It was a terrible place. The only other people there were banker types, yeah? Yeah, but so at least it was cheap. No, it was cheap for the company, the American company. The American company thought, great, it's got shiny buildings, yeah, but it just didn't get, the, it wasn't good for the zeitgeist for creative people to ah, work okay. in. Mm -hmm. And all the feeder stuff like research companies, where you would, a place where you record artists or edit stuff, was in so and, and hadn't built the railway to Docklands yet. Hadn't built the tube, hadn't built the DLR. Okay. 
Wow. So even get not only about four or five miles, it would take you two hours to get from there into Seoul. What, by bus or? or by bus, taxi, whatever it is. Yeah, it was impossible, oh. yeah. And uh, so in Seoul, oh. you may be working on four different clients. Got a voiceover, casting, see a photographer, look at a model, mate, and just walk out the door. There they were, yeah. yeah. So you can do four things at once there. It was like really bad. And for, as I said, advertise for creators are very, uh, and for other people, uh, and, uh, and uh, you can have, you know, lose an account, you get fired. Uh, may not be your fault, but, but because you're out there, uh, you, you couldn't meet anybody to get, a, get another job. And so he just walked out the nearest pub, say, oh, I'm just thinking, I'll have a job, and oh, I'll turn up tomorrow, and off you go, yeah. It was like, like that. So it, um, same, same happens if you... Uh, so are you saying that this was not really great for you to be, uh, to be efficient no, no. at 1M? No, no, for, for me to go there, it was, uh, I'd, I'd, I'd start in a, a multinational agency and then a European one. And then I'd start my own company, which was uh, mainly UK-based business, and start again into bigger European businesses. Okay. And when that company was sold, my, my company was started with about about 14 other similar companies started at the same time, all people like me, my age, who were doing UK-style advertising rather than copying Americans or pop, yeah. you know, pop down with Formula X, so doing all this stuff. We're all, it was a big, big red meat kind of people who, who were in reinventing everything. It was, it was like based in Saatchi and after, you know, you know, Saatchi and Saatchi after about 10 years of starting buying every agency in America and France and stuff. I mean, well, that di it was so dynamic uh, that everybody thought, well, uh, we'll start our own. Everybody starts our own. But what happened, uh, London got very, very expensive. Mm -hmm. Us as a company, even for instance, we started buying allied companies, like which were through the line companies, events companies, joint ventures with media companies, all doing it in a new different way, as opposed to the slow way of doing things, which was all right with slow moving clients. When you got yes. faster and faster moving clients, you had to build these alliances very quickly, buy them. And unfortunately, London at the time, all the property, most of my friends' agencies, yeah, all the greenies trots or or widening uh, 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 rainy Cali Campbell did go sort of almost bust or buy, they just couldn't buy property or get property or get rid of the old, old property. It was like it was squeezed. Are we talking about the real estate here to be to the offices? Yeah, you know, you know. So they were, you know, offices were, and certainly in Soho in that area were the highest higher than in, than in uh, the city. Uh, and all these new agencies were like people with their only, they're only funded by themselves. Yeah, of course. Yeah. You could never go to the city. Say, oh, I've got an idea for an ad agency. Give me a million pounds and just laugh at you. Tell you to go back to the your, your clubs. Yeah. Uh, so it was all feeling, and it just it just became very very difficult. Even even, even people like uh, I had a friend had a set of ten or twelve recording studios for. For voiceovers, etc., like a really top top company called uh, the, the, the Tape Gallery, and to build one room to do voiceovers, etc., mm -hmm. I've cost them a million million pounds. And instead, as soon as they finished building it, it would be losing fifty thousand a year just because it would or more. Gosh, this has changed so much. It's so are you saying that because yeah, very much so? Yeah, now it's yeah. like the offices are empty in, uh, in the yeah. centers of uh, big cities and capitals. So are you saying that due to all these um, overheads and in particular this real estate? Yeah, cheers, cheers, it's good to squeeze. So I knew by that time because I knew when it's uh, start that. You prefer to move on to an O and M. No, no, one of the guys out, one of the first guys I worked with, uh, uh, and funny enough, who I did the aid stuff with, David O'Connor Thompson. Yeah. He said to me, uh, when I first started, I've been absolutely obsessed with advertising from the age of 12. That's what I wanted to do. And he okay. said, so what are you going to do? In the first week, so what are you going to do after advertising? I said, what do you mean? I've spent all my life trying to get in. No, nah, nobody, <laughs> nobody you, you never last till 40. You know, you, you, he you, said you, that to you? Yeah. And he was right. <laughs> he was he right. Was right. He was right, yeah. He was so this was perfect. back in 98 that you moved to O&M. And yeah, yeah, so basically what happened, they, they were, Ford. they'd lost their luster in, uh, when they moved to Canary Wharf. Nobody yeah. wanted to work there. Couldn't get top creative directors okay. who want to work there. 
and people who have all the hassle of doing that and big deal stuff, mm -hmm. and the difficulty of doing, the physical difficulty of getting stuff done quickly was just uh, impossible to do. Mm -hmm. So what, but God, by that time I'd worked in a place like TBWA, which is a European agency, and I'd worked on the camps that were be made, being made around Europe, and I knew how New York worked. I'd worked in New York for a little bit on, like launched absolute vodka there and things like that. So I knew how it all worked. A veteran and a, and a, top, a top creative. And no, I was a veteran, even though I was about 35 or something. I, had. So I, was, like, I was a veteran then, you know. Yeah. Uh, so I knew, I knew I could make it work, and I, I knew I had enough people I could call on to make good work and get it made. And I said it's going to get made, it'll get made, yeah. Okay. And, my, and I, I worked there for about a year and a half, and the funny enough, the guy that hired me, uh, uh, so John Cully left and went off to start uh, uh, a, a different type of agency he wanted to do, that was based in Soho, not in... Canada. Sorry, so was that before of the UNM experience, or was that... So, out? so, so I, just, I, just got the, I just got to join him, and then he, can you hear me now? Yes. And Patrick Costa, who was running the UK business, uh, he eventually, uh, and the guy was got in to work with a guy called Leon Jean yeah. from White White Collins, Rutherford Scott. He's mentioned. I've worked with him before on some projects. Okay. He's top guy, and uh, and uh, we would start working. Well, it's the first week he said, oh, "I'm going to go back to White Collins and do something else." Your friend or you? I mean, you in this Canary War. You yeah, said that. Yeah, another he person I've worked with. No, no he, he, he he decided to leave, yeah. Oh, gosh. And I thought, so well, I've been here a year and a bit. I'll be there in a bit. I'm going to be working on a big, big thing. I'll 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 do sort of things out. And there were some quite good people there. But okay. they just had no direction and no discipline. And they were very disheartened people because it was like... In the middle uh, of nowhere. Working in the <laughs> middle of nowhere. So I knew, I knew someone... Some of them had actually passed through my hands and other agencies, and I knew in uh, uh, the core of people I can get some people to do really good work. And so, what, for example, what did you do for Ford in relation to the experience at ONM? Do you mind just mentioning one of the projects you did for Ford in order for them to get more, you know, your more uh, sexy product? Uh, uh, the, 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 fir the first thing that we did uh, was. Um, we did some for small cars like car kit and and, and uh, we're trying to make more like a little, little car have a bit of sex appeal, yeah. Yeah, the one exactly. we did did as, a, did as a likened it to sports car to a sort of Nike kind of trainer, the cool. same shape, all that. Another one we did where great had idea. Great hand, handling we shot on a big ice rink with silver curtains and made it very smooth for the smoother one, yeah. Okay. One for a little car. For a little car to be sporty, that was attractive and been saying that was very good on surfaces. It was good. Yes, yeah, so I took this soulless little nothing car and made it more of a performance car. So that was that's like on a product car. But I did okay. a big uh, I did a but big you actually, uh, sorry, just on this note, if I may, Michael, that sometimes you are being referenced as a designer in the various things. Well, Is well, that, well, 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 no, are you no, a well, designer? No, no, well, well, I'm a I'm a creative uh my background was at art direction. Okay. And then I became a creative director, so I can write and design and all that. I can do the whole lot, yeah. Because I remember you mentioned, if I, uh, and sorry, I'm just um, backtracking here, but when we chatted some, you know, like uh, a few years ago, I remember, did, uh, did you not say to me that you were actually the first person to actually ever go to university and to study art? In, in my school, in my school, yeah. In your, uh, in your school, okay, I thought My in your school. family. Uh, uh, and uh, the advertising course, uh, advertising course I went to in Manchester was yeah. the first pure advertising course in the country. Awesome. And, that was, and I finished that in 73. In fact, I've just been to Manchester for a reunion of people that were on that course. Uh, and 73, I wasn't born yet. Yeah. And everybody that was in the course I did advertise, most people were very, very successful. Most came to London. Some went to, went to America, yes. etc. Okay. Uh, and they were all very, very successful. Okay. Uh, like you. <laughs> yeah, no, no, because we're all very competitive and yeah. we, we knew the new stuff, yeah. At the right time in the right, at the, uh, yeah. in the right, right, right place. It's like, it's like the Beatles discovering guitars, yeah. <laughs> you know, 
three years before that, they'd be playing trumpets in a brass band and getting over it. As soon as electric <laughs> guitar came out, the in hope in an over, yeah. yeah. Okay, so um, okay, so you basically were so 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 so, 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 so one thing I'd to try try to unify. We did a uh, thing about a uh, new shape, new vision. Mm-hmm. And we took uh, all the whole product line of cars, there's about 12 different product car, like cars, from small to large, painted them all silver. And it was sp- supposed to be just a, a, a dealer promotion idea. In mm-hmm. other words, this was a finance promotion. Saying, so you get a brief or tell, tell people to buy a new Ford for 0% finance. And, and most people... Once you've got a brief letter, I'll just hand it to a junior or a, a has been. Okay. Give me a little press out like it, yeah? And I worked out that this was all happening all over Europe. So I took all that money. I could make a big, big, massive film, yeah, and make a big, big thing out of it, yeah? It's no percent finance. And what we did, we shot, got a whole range of cars, about 12 cars, made them all silver, uh, and shot this film about bringing these desirable cars to a whole range of people in the background uh, from all over Europe. Yeah, so we shot this film for a million and a half pounds. Yeah, Jesus. so this is a de- deal advert, which you normally see in a, a, a little local cinema or a crappy thing or a crappy thing. That is a lot of money for one advertisement. Yeah. So, and we set set out to shoot it in the. Uh, uh, Nevada desert in America uh, <laughs> on in, in uh, Lake George or something Lake George somewhere and was set off to do it so we had all these 12 cars shipped all these European cars shipped out to the States and the idea was that uh, with CGI there's this big bone the river cars are driving along the desert which was going to be shot, shot on Salt Lake uh, Flats and then they come to this bridge, and across the bridge, there's all these different people gathering. So we had all these, every multi-nation, national person looking, uh, children, adults, good-looking women, guys, sort of walking us through the uh, 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 flat, deserty whiteness, yeah? So it was all shot in black and white, yeah? Black, white, and silver. And was it successful in uh, in and it, and it, yeah, yeah, they're all pro- approaching each other, but they'll come to this chasm, but then CGI would build this huge shiny silver bridge, which had the shape when you pulled back, it was a zero, like 0%. So the car you want for the kind of people you are, the 0% from uh, Ford, you, 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 you'll be able to get what you want, yeah? It's all done in slow motion, beautifully shot like a Vogue yeah? Which was totally unlike Ford. When we got there, uh, unfortunately, the um, Salt Lake Flats flooded. So we shot... One part of it with the, the, the canyon, etc., and uh, we had to get a Russian uh, gigantic jumbo jet to land in the desert nearby, put all the cars on, and fly them to the Sahara Desert, Morocco. Gosh, yeah. now I see where your one million pound budget went. <laughs> no, no, that, no, it started off a million, million a bit. It went up about two and a half million. Yeah. <gasps> And we had to build. Then you got road, fired. <laughs> roads, no, no, roads in the deserts, all this kind of stuff. Get all the recast all the people in Morocco, etc. Oh. Do the same, all the Armani suits, and then CGI all of them. But we had to do it in a month. That was a thing. I had to do. It. I only had a month to do it because it was just a promotion. Uh, it was was really su- successful. Really was it? Safe, safe board, yeah. Because it made, it made, instead of looking like this little company offering cheap deals to get a cheap mm-hmm. car. It was like, this is the biggest car company in the world doing this big thing for everybody, yeah. Did it give a lot uh, of business to, uh, to Ford? Yeah, yeah, they, they did very well out of it, yeah. And uh, and they also gave heart to the people at Ford and the sales people thinking, well, we can sell that's a very simple idea, no percent on everything, best deal in town, you know, whatever everybody says. and, and, and Together, all the cars actually had a bit of commonality, even though they weren't all common. Yeah. Had, I'd make them all silver and drive it the same way and the same kind of stuff. They had that feel that they're... I mean, being, to a being degree, being they're, they're, yeah. this is the same approach that uh, Apple is is is, yeah. is, is, yeah. is taking. I mean, it's all, as you were saying, silver products. 
and you can get some zero percent loans on that so you can buy yeah. you know yeah. and I, I make the most of that i mean not in france but in the uk so when i yeah. when i go to the regent street store and i need something you know I, i'm sure i, I get to deal at zero percent and then i pay it off in one year in six months yeah. cool yeah, yeah and, and apple is definitely a luxury company but, so well done but, for but, it. but if you present them in a way that it still looks luxury yeah, exactly goodness. yeah uh, you know, I used to work with Johnny Ive, who's Sir Johnny Ive, who, who designs all the Apple products. I think he's back to the UK now. He yeah, just he, did a project he, 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 with uh, yeah. this, uh, this, this twat of uh, Prince Charles or something. Excuse yeah. me, French. Yeah. <laughs> when I used to work for, with him in the store, he'd be doing wine labels. <laughs> wine <laughs> labels with Johnny yeah. Ive? Yeah, that's why he was just the nondescript uh, designer. Probably in um, his, uh, his pre Apple era then. Yeah, pre Apple. And uh, yeah. he. He was just doing nowhere, and all the big designers in the UK, in London, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. were only big because they had enough money to afford a studio, a design studio with, with benches and people and all that kind of stuff. And they couldn't work out how you'd ever afford. And then this job came up with that. He, he'd been working, did a bit of thing for Braun. Mm -hmm. Braun had a very good idea. We'll, we'll, you can design shavers, but we'll give you 10% of the time where you can design anything you want and use the studios and fulfill your. Your, your quality as a designer on other other projects, yeah. So it's quite a good idea, I think, for any any design company in the future yeah. or architect or something, yeah. Uh, and he, and at the time, Apple was sort of funny grey colour. This Apple that looked like Ronald McDonald. I remember. Yeah, I remember. It looked, looked, looked like it looked like palette toy. It was. It was not very cool. It was a joke thing, <laughs> and he he knew that by. That people wanted these computers, but he knew that these designery types mm. would never work, have one of these crappy things because it just looked naff. Yeah. I mean, Steve Jobs was not the most. I mean, he no, no, was it wasn't. never the yeah. most best dressed man ever. I don't think he had no, a no, particularly no, very no, good um, no, design no, no. sense himself. I mean, Johnny Ive did really ace the yeah. design. Of so, so, so he just knew that if you made it all in silver or black or exactly. shiny, he took took all the knobbly bits off. Yeah, that yeah. people would not just pay 10% more, they pay twice as much more. And that for at them, least, at least. Uh, he knew there was a big enough market for des the designers so who will pay twice as much more for a similar product. Yeah. Uh, and that became a badge, badge of honor. So, for instance, you've got a saw house or anything like that and walk through, nobody's got anything but that. Sorry about the noise. Um, yeah, no, I mean, indeed, it's, it is a success story. Just, just like, just like Nike or Adidas, who are designed for people to play baseball and you know stuff like that. No, but then uh, it was taken over by the rappers. Did you see that great yeah, sneaker yeah, yeah, exhibition yeah, yeah. design museum? Yeah. I saw it twice. I loved it. Yeah. Yeah, so but, it was like all these rappers started buying but, Adidas in the US. Yeah, it was yeah, awesome. Yeah, status. Yeah, no, but they're, they're not doing high jumps or running marathons, are they? They're just <laughs> selling, selling drugs and making music, yeah. Well, it depends, because then at the concerts, they were saying, so who is wearing your Adidas? Show me your Adidas! Yeah. Yeah, 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 they were yeah. just like, it was crazy. It was, as you were saying, like a status thing. Yeah. Everybody was wearing Adidas. Yeah. I love that exhibition on sneakers at the Design Museum. Yeah, also. Well, it's, just like, it's just like Red Star in uh, Paris, you know, the, the football club, yeah? No, sorry, what? You know, Red, <laughs> Red Star... Red Star uh, Paris, it's a football club, Is but it? it's th third division. It's the coolest brand in, in the world. Everybody wants their shirt. They want to make about the. What is Red Star Paris? Is that in Paris, in France? It's a, it's a fo football club, yeah. But where is so, it based? It's in the north, north, north suburb of Paris. You just check them out, Red Star. They're yeah. uber cool, uber, uber, uber cool. Red Star Paris, unbelievable. Well, thanks for letting me know. I had no idea. <laughs> Yeah. So, but people in the know, okay. Yeah, the people in the know, them and Saint Pauli in the Hamburg, they are the other one. Yeah. Interesting. I, I'll, I'll Google it later. So, yeah. coming back to your career, as opposed to Johnny's uh, career. So, there was something also that I noticed. So, thanks for, by the way, thanks for explaining several projects you did for Ford. That was that was really yeah. helpful to understand what it is that you you were doing in in this career. Um, I also found an article from The Guardian who uh, uh, refers you as uh, a designer, uh, as I was saying. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah, but they, they do that, yeah, they do that. 
Uh, no, nobody, nobody knows what an art director is in advertising or okay. or what a what a copywriter is. You know, nobody knows. Okay, nobody knows. No, no worries. In the UK, everybody work, people work in pairs, and the crossover sometimes. Sometimes do the writing, sometimes do the art direction. When it gets to film or radio, who's the uh -huh. art director on the radio? You know, well, exactly. so the pair is made of is made of one art director and the other is what a copywriter. Uh, that that's, uh, used to be in the old days when advertising would, was done by um, newspapers or magazines. Okay, yeah. There'd be an art department where people would have to draw the ads up or design yeah. them. There'd be a writing department who would write the words, etc. So and you're called... Sorry, sorry, sorry. So, so tradi traditionally, in the past, uh, the writers all went to public school and all, all literature, lit literary types, you know, because they can write. And all the art directors are sort of working class crafts people who can assemble things. And the UK differed where they decided to put them together because, of, because like what would normally happen, a writer would write an idea for something, send it down the corridor, somebody would take it and turn it into something. We watch Mad Men, the early days of the Mad Men stuff, that's mm -hmm. what happens. But the UK decided to put the two of them together. Okay. And, and they worked out that one and one equals three. So you get the you double your career. to work on advertising projects. Yeah, so because because right. you can a lot more oh. cross pollination. Yeah, 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 uh, yeah. And that's that's why the UK suddenly became very very dynamic. So who was your pair for yourself? Who was the other the well, other? Well, well the first time per, first person was this guy called John Patterson, who okay. now lives in a, lives in a, a, a wood a wooden hut in his forest somewhere, and all went green. Uh, Where, whereabouts in Wales, you said? In, uh, somewhere in Yorkshire. Another guy was uh, Dominic Lynch Robinson, who's a lord now. He lives in Miami. Uh, his father used to be the chairman of uh, Leah Burnett, the first agency I worked at. Nice fellow. Very famous, Burnett. Uh, then uh, David O'Connor Thompson, I worked with in, uh, in uh, Leah Burnett. And who eventually I got him in to work on my age stuff in uh, 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 TPWA. David, had, he left this. He was the guy that said you'll never last more than forty years. Uh, he, he was the guy that said you'll never last more than forty years. But he was, he was a very good writer. He lives in a hostel now, a homeless hostel now in East London. He's like the top guy, you know. Yeah, he couldn't cope. Wait, but what do you mean? He was homeless. Else, uh, story, he got. He went bust. He went bankrupt. He, he went bust. He went bankrupt. He lost his way because because of that. And uh, he's still a very good writer. Uh, and I got, I mean, he, yeah, that's, that's and he, he was one of of a guy you paired up and was doing yeah, yeah, writing. Yeah, 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 he's doing very well. Yeah, bathrooms giving me the goosebumps. And he, yeah, he, and he, lot, he, 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 did you say in the homeless hostel? I ever heard. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. He left advertising and went to, went to do a literature degree in, okay. in Sussex and then found out nobody will pay you to write <laughs> literature. And, uh, you know, he was like a top, top person. And he, yeah, he, right. He, 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 he but, does, there might be a little bit of mental illness, illness here, don't you think? No, no, no. no? It, it just, no? just, just, you know, a public, public school boy without any money. Uh, and he was wow. led, to, led to be the, the world is your world will always be wonderful and then okay. you know then it became very competitive and a lot of people can't compete working class people like me know what it's like to be at the bottom so we can cope with if you end up in the bottom but people who have a charmed life can't do that do you think this was uh, the case he, he went from a, a privileged background he, he came yeah. from a privileged background yeah 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 and a lot of people my, my ne next right after that was uh, neil patterson he went to a, a school like prince charles went to Okay. Top, in, top international uh, right, right, uh, fisherman, as well as a writer and lit author, and he's brilliant. He's done well. He's done uh, well. Yeah. There's a lot, okay. lot of funny people. A lot of up, oh. up and down in, in the business, yeah. Right, right, right. Right. Uh, okay, so, so in this article from The Guardian, was I saying, <laughs> they yeah. refer to you as a designer and, um, and you are basically interpreted there where you are saying that you were in your with your agency, TBWA, and that yeah. you're working on health campaigns uh, for yeah. five years or so, so blood donations, rubella epidemics. So do yeah. you, would you please explain to us how this project um, for the um, AIDS campaign 
um, uh, yeah. uh, came about and how you contributed, like you worked on it with Norman Fowler, who was the health secretary in, back in yeah. 1981, yeah. 1987. Oh. This is Norman Fowler's book. Okay. About, about all that, yeah. So, so he was an expert uh, on AIDS or? Uh, no, I, funny enough, I, I invented the word AIDS. That's the first thing, yeah. Come on. Uh, really? Yeah. What uh, does it stand for, yeah, by the way? It was known as uh, it's immune deficiency syndrome, you know, That's autoimmune right. deficiency syndrome, yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, what, what it was was that um, I'd worked on a lot of government accounts. Okay. Uh, my little, small agency, but we were very, very creative. We were one of the best agencies in town for creative work. TBWA. Uh, yeah, so small agency, and there was, and they have a lot of work to come, and a lot of work in other com com Wonderful. companies. Wonderful. Like Satch used to do all the uh, army recruitment, and Ogilvy would do uh, road safety and stuff out. Like and we got a lot of the healthcare, we were very responsible with the people that worked there. Mm -hmm. And we worked on a lot of sensitive things, like apart from blood donation and the organ donation, but also. Kids dying. I used to go and record kids dying on, on, on microphones for a campaign to get people to take vaccinations for whooping cough, rubella. For, 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 so, for rubella. Mm -hmm. yeah. okay. So, so, we're, we're kids dying good. on microphones? What do you mean? That you were actually recording them while they were yeah. firing? Yeah, they were coughing to death, yeah. <gasps> okay. So, so I didn't know that this, this, this is what, uh, this is, uh, what, Rubella, I mean, when you're not so, yeah. what they had like uh, pulmonary infections, yeah, 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 your yeah. throat restricts and see a strangle yourself, yeah, oh. that's whooping cough, yeah. Oh. Uh, it's it common childhood disease, but with proper immunization, you overcome it, yeah, yeah, that, that kind of thing. Uh, so we got we got the gig because we had the emergency. Uh, account for emergency diseases, and this was starting to happen, yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, there's a little rumor, rumors about town and the world, this sort of funny disease turning up. We got that main one of the reasons, apart from the people that we'd be working with, the, the organization that they're going to put together to start working at, we knew them all quite well because working across lots of different accounts. Also, knew that we do TV, we do press, we could do. Uh, brochures that kind of we're capable of that. We also had a studio that were capable of doing that. But some of the work that we'd ever do would be sensitive. And if you have your own studio, you can keep that locked down. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you're a company like Sachi or Low Howard Spink, they're using lots of outside people and, and whatever you're doing, uh, that was sensitive information that would leak straight away. Yeah? Okay. Uh, so the new we 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 could do the work and we're we're, we're uh, solid enough to keep it all quiet, yeah. And uh, so and and also because we're so based, I, I knew quite a lot of people, a lot of my a lot of friends of mine died from AIDS, you know, before it was all okay. happening. Uh, so we knew what it was all about, yeah, and we knew the kind of people they're talking about, yeah, how was transmitted drug addicts. They, most of them were were they gays or? Were they well, gay, gay, gays, gays or drug addicts or whatever it is, but also knew the consequences and how all that okay. happens, yeah? Yeah. So we got we got the good thing, and there was lots of – the first thing was what I decided, because it was at the time where nobody knew what's happening. Norman Fowler was seconded to with the chief medical officer and some others, a woman, woman called Baroness Trumpington, who, who was uh, in the House of Lords, and she was there, the, the parliamentary – Link it kind of person, and then they got together people like all the nursing unions, the uh, medical people, the uh, army, navy, prison officers, all these people together as a think tank to start working out what they do. Wow! And at the time, Margaret Thatcher was in charge. Yeah, she was a very, very uh, you know, not my favorite person, but she yeah, I, I I read that she wasn't uh, she wasn't very open to the idea of doing that campaign, which was so sad. So it wasn't was it wasn't at all. Uh, <laughs> okay. Uh, because any any mention of transmission by sex or drugs, she thought that would attract more people. More people would suddenly get the idea. Ooh, Sounds no, like a big that. way of reasoning. I mean, yeah. no, but that's, that's just like you know, it's just like from a from a sort of backward part of the country, yeah. 
so not much about it, Baroness Trump and all that. They went on off to America and see what was going on. Some people went off to Africa to find out what's going on. Well, I, th uh, I think what was going on is that in America, the um, in the US in particular, the the, the disease um, struck much earlier. I mean, earlier than the seventies, it was around. It, it, it struck a lot all the time, but they had evidence of it striking. Yeah. Exactly. Other people were dying of a cancer or pneumonia or mm -hmm. whatever it was. It was just more evident there. Yeah. Uh, just like just like uh, COVID, certain countries recognize it and report it and calculate and collate it. So they so it may not be they were the first. It was probably in Africa uh, it started, but nobody the people are just dying. People die all every day in Africa. You know who knows? Yeah. Of uh, of strange so, disease. So Actually, but, but AIDS actually had started in America. You you are saying that perhaps in Africa they had AIDS already. Yeah, yeah well, yeah, yeah yes, that, that was the the eventual uh, thing. That was, uh, was oh, okay. an African disease, mainly, mainly from transmission of stuff, you know, uh, in the field. Um, and then spread through prostitution and uh, bad, bad uh, habits, you know, with uh, blood, etc. Uh, but at the time, there's lots of different companies start start to report these things. Oh, people have got these kind of symptoms. Oh, we we've got them in Gambia. Oh, oh, we've got them in you know Switzerland. You know. Okay. And they all had they all had localized names. Like in France, it was Sida, S I D A. Some place in America. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So are we okay? Can you got me? She, yeah. She back. got it because. Because her background was a, a scientific background. She was a chemist. But she might have chemist. The Baroness. Work. Yeah, okay. uh, no, the uh, Margaret Thatcher. Oh, Thatcher, really? I got yeah. it. So that. she, 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 uh, she went and did chemistry or something. So she had a scientific background. So okay. she was not not persuaded by anything that was about morals or or human emotion. It was like no scientific, <laughs> scientific thing. Okay. So so she went very much understood logic, you know. Yeah. So, so, so the f first thing was like. Naming of it, etc. And I knew that um, that to that it would be better to uh, identify the disease, give it a name, give it a, a logo, which I did, like the AIDS one, uh, and then you would be fighting the disease, not the people who have it or the people who transmit it. Yeah. Okay. So to detach it from people and people's habits and say that it's the disease that's the enemy, not the people. Yeah, because that person eventually could be you or the kids or something, eh? So that was the thing that she got. She understood that. What she got from even... Based on scientific as you, evidence, as you were oh, saying. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. it's not the people. It's This is the disease. Okay. This is like polio. It's not people. Polio. Did you actually speak to her? Uh, yeah, in some of the big meetings, yeah. The, oh. I was I was not allowed to speak that much, but I would I'd be saying, what do you think? Well, that, that's... I think that's what that's what we'll do, yeah. Uh, fight, was she very fight, directive yeah. during those meetings or was she uh she, she yeah, she, she had a job to be done and the job that we did had good people with her. Okay. Uh things like uh when she was worried about is it necessary to do campaigns about this? And yeah. the chief medical chief medical officer would say, "Well, there's, we've got no antidotes, and we don't know how it's working. It could be worse." And this was before they even found out that it could be transmitted through birth. You know, that we carried on to to birth. Yeah. Yeah. So going about that, so that was the medical stuff. Then things like, um, well, it must be gay as time to pack it in. Baroness Trumping would explain how this prostitute, male prostitute in San Francisco. That she met in the hospital there, who uh, was such a bad prostitute, he's innocent uh, being ripped up. And he had a colostomy bag and he was selling the hole in his stomach for sex and thought, oh, well, we can't tell people like that not to do it. I didn't have to she tell said that. This woman, this baroness, said that during the meeting with uh, Thatcher. With Mark Hart of Thatcher. And then, well, you know, I would have been fatter. Things. I would have just basically fallen out of my chair if someone had told me that. Yeah. Oh my God! And then, some, then someone said about, uh, well, just turn the packing in. We'll close all the gay clubs. 
And then some of the army people said, well, we, we do have it in the army and the navy. And the navy said, oh, yeah, especially, especially the submarines. <laughs> And it was like that. And then, <laughs> and, and, then, and then it was some people from business. Well, how do we insure people in our insurance thing? will all go wrong. We we'll don't know how to get insurance for all sorts right. of. But so, are you saying that at the time, they, like the community of scientists that still not understood that they, you had to have protected sex through condoms? Well, well the only way. To protect yourself to, against AIDS? Well, well, actually, there's two lots. There's two, the two big borders was a. Uh, unprotected sex, and you know who's who's having it. And that's a lot of prostitution, a lot of uh, illicit sex. Yeah, and uh, and you got to remember a lot of parts of the world there's no was no birth control, and a lot of parts of the world has institutional prostitution like the Far East and Africa, etc. Yeah, and uh, things like prostitution in, in Africa, where you can work down a, as a line down a motorway or a road route. Seriously? India or, or Africa, all the lorry drivers, that's where all the, all the uh, would spread, things mm -hmm. like that. And in the, in the UK, uh, you can work out also in the UK in certain parts of the world, like America, a lot of it was being transmitted by blood to blood from injecting uh, drug mm -hmm. users. Yeah. So uh, we had a, well, for drug, so, drug, drug addicts, you mean? Yeah. Well, drug addicts, just you sharing needles. Yeah. Uh, or, or selling their bodies for, for drugs. Right, yeah. right, 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 right. All, all, all tricky stuff. Right? And then eventually, fortunately... There was a scandal in France where basically some of the... Yeah. Some, 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 some blood taken out for transfusion, you know, for... Yeah. Uh, had, was, had been infected by, by, by AIDS and then it was yeah. spread out to some people who were sick yeah. because they yeah, needed blood. Yeah. So that was a big scandal back in the... Well, 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 well that scandal also was the same thing in the UK and what had happened, okay. we were working on blood donation and they were always right. chipping away at the blood donation uh, budget. So they were not we're, testing for the AIDS at the time. Yeah, yeah. And the blood donation stuff in Britain used to be quite successful because uh, at the time there was lots of big factories, uh, shipyards, mines, car plants, etc., where if you give blood, you got a couple of hours off your shift to go and give blood. People would come at so it's a very easy way to get. I gave blood. blood once in my life, and when I, and, and when I actually tried to stand up, I almost fainted. So I said, never yeah. ever again. <laughs> I can't stand it. <laughs> so, so it was all done, but they, they ran down the service quite a lot in the UK and they started importing the blood. They imported mm -hmm. a lot of blood oh, from America, wow. mm -hmm. and that was given a lot of the people that were donating the blood were prisoners in the American penitentiaries. And of course, of yeah, course, they were sick. I mean, they were do, 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 dodgy people selling the blood to pay for a fix. Yeah. Oh my God. And those were sent back to Europe. Hemophiliacs, etc., operations of people using that stuff, and and that got out, yeah. Okay, so there, it was really like a moment of crisis when you actually. Oh yeah, very yeah. So, so what so, were the key messages that you actually? Um, so the key, the key, the key, the key, the key thing. The first thing was give it a name. It's it's the, the disease, not the people. Okay. And okay. and ad, admit to the general public you don't know what's going to happen. Yeah. Ah, so like but, it really like no one had any idea. Yeah, we sure don't we protect against it. You know, we we don't know what's going on, but we recognise it's it's a monumental big thing. Yeah, that's why we did the big. It's uh, not very reassuring though for the public, is no, it? No, no, it is for the it is for the public. At least saying well, because all the newspapers, magazines, word of mouth were making things up. Or it could be this, could be that. Should do this, should do that. Just just like COVID, you know. But the government okay, had okay, okay. It would like one, we try, one, one, we one the trial and testing method, sorry. Yeah, we sat the speaker's one voice saying, no matter what people are saying, the only way that you can guarantee getting the, the correct information, whatever information we get, is by listening to government uh, communication. Everything else is like neither right nor wrong. So the only one is that. So make it as big as possible. Make it to everyone, not just everyone. Every household in the country got a leaflet. Every post in the country uh, when it was launched was an AIDS poster. 
everything big on TV was was that. But so you were, at the moment, the government was not saying to people yet, you need to have protected sex with condoms. Not, 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 not yet. yet. Not It's yet. a big thing. After that, once she got their attention and said, our, our, our word is the true word, then you can start summing up doing things like that. But certain things like uh, we also did discreet campaigns to um, different types of drug addicts, you know, like that would target them. Uh, different kinds of. Processes. Was there a big drug epidemics in the, the UK at the time, or? Uh, there was a, was a opening up of uh, heroin being taken as a, an injectable drug. Right. It was an aside, on the east coast of Britain, uh, it was an injectable drug. On yeah. the west coast of Britain, it was a smoked drug. Uh, it was more Asian, Asian people that would smoke it and then inject it. East coast. Funny, funny, funny enough, was trafficked by biker gangs. Yeah, so we had to by what? Motorcycle gangs. No, oh, oh, we're um, traveling. We're, we're bringing it up, taking it around, and all that. They had very little supplies, so to make it go further, a smaller thing go further. Yeah, we cut it. Inject, inject it. So yeah. if you look at um, train spotting, that was shot in Edinburgh, and they're all injecting. Yeah. In Glasgow, they'd all be smoking it. Glasgow and Manchester, they'd be smoking it. And you get, now, these are epidemiological people. Okay. The so there was a bit of a drug epidemic going on as well, right? Yeah, but also you try to get them from the injecting stuff and smoking it. So right, you, right, right, right. You'd tell the police. Well, even the, better, stop completely the whole drug. No, you can't do that. Yeah, that, there we realise you can't tell anybody not to do things. They just. Okay, but also, at the same time, businesses were closing down. Hairdressers, jewellers, tattooists. Uh, uh, yeah. all this kind of stuff was closed. Oh, really? So there was like uh, some new, new, I mean, everybody was getting a bit yeah. rotten. Yeah. So we eventually did very nice, this same kind of information that we started then about clean needles or, 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 wear gloves, gloves and all that stuff. Mm. We would do beautiful, beautiful, uh, is that guy there, that's the top, uh, top corner. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. That artist there, um, uh, Christopher Brown, he was a gay artist, yeah? And he did a, he, he did all the leaflet designs for me, beautiful pictures of different of your tattoos or, a, or a, you know, a dentist, etc. And uh, on beautiful uh, handmade paper, so you have them in your salon. Mm -hmm. So it became, this. Is, these people are doing it properly, got some nice stuff to tell you rather than shouty, shouty, horrible stuff. So we tuned different messages to the different types of stuff for people to be receptive and actually act on, yeah. So you've got, to be, you've got to be really immersed into understanding the people and what motivates them and how will they receive messages. So it's so yeah. not the same messages, mm -hmm. but, but, but uh, handed over to people in a way that they accept them. Right. Yeah. We found... We plus, found plus, Yeah, plus right, I do lots of, uh, you know, multi-language kind of stuff as well, yeah. In the UK? Yeah. Was uh, the um, the client, so Thatcher in this case, pleased with yeah, the records it, or? Yeah, because yeah, it worked. She, she it worked. the big phone we did, we went with the CI is very good, that they can get anybody to do anything. So when yeah. Nicholas Rode, Rogue, who's a big Hollywood but, uh, director, directed it. John Hurt, who's like a Tom Shakespearean actor, he just come out of Alien. He did the voiceover. So if you say, who do you want to film the part? I want Nick Rogue because he's wanted to have this sort of crazy sort of apocalypse now moonscape kind of thing. Nick Rogue, he's the guy. Uh, John Hurt, he's the, the voice of God, you know. Yeah. You know yeah. Well, somebody doing the sound, you know, the best in the world, yeah. That was the ad you did. That's one of the ads you did. Yeah, that was sort of the main ad for that. There was some other ads I did before that, and then some ads after that. But you still okay. use good people. But but that stuff happened as an attention seeker. This is this exists. Tick. This one's about the disease, not the people. Tick. Yeah. This affects different people in different ways. Tick. 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 Oh, well, you know, it's. And, that, I mean, and after that, all the big money would say, well. Who needs the money behind it? Well, the uh, uh, drug addicts need more 
work, and it's best to do that uh, below the line through uh, through um, you know person person peer group stuff and all that. Right. Things like uh, as I said, tattoos. And you, you need some softer stuff, you know, and then off, off to go again. Wonderful, and um, I'm, I'm, sorry. So um, and, 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 and it worked. It worked. You know. Yeah. No. No. That's that's, that's what fantastically it worked. Yeah. Um, just to finish, actually, on these pu uh, public campaigns uh, set up by the government to make people aware. Um, uh, I never had a TV set, okay, in my life. I was brought up without a TV set, and I used to go and see my uh, my pen friend in Hampstead, Cherry Freeman, um, who I bumped into back in, uh, I think, in 2009, 2008 in, in Bond Street, and she she she, uh, she was horribly pissed off at me daring to speak to her. Anyway, uh, so I used to, like, from the age of 12 years old onwards, I used to take, you know, the ferry, like, the, 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 there, was a, yeah. there was a bus and then the ferry, and then I, I used to go and sit uh, and come and, uh, and meet Cherry here in, uh, I mean, there in, in Hampstead, and then she would come to my, uh, my, my parents' house in, um, in the suburbs of Paris. So it was fun. Um, but then, so this was, like, more or less the first, ta first time that I, ha I, I, I was in contact with UK TV, uh, uh, from the age of 12 years old onwards when, when I went to see Cherry and uh, her two sisters in Hampstead. And what I noticed from the outset watching uh, 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 UK TV is that the, um, the ads coming from the government were usually extremely punchy, um, be it about uh, road safety, about... Lit, 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 litter, coughs and sneezes, spread disease, all that stuff, yeah. Right, and also you know being very careful with with drugs and and yeah, yeah. and so why my question was well frankly in the in France whenever I was going to my grandparents' house in the summers um, in a uh, French TV was extremely subdued you know they, they never had this sort of yeah. punchy uh, slap in your face type of approach to to yeah. basically really mark you so that you re would remember the message. So where where do you why do you think the, the Brits were doing this with this uh, with this public um, awareness campaigns? Um, well, 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 they've been doing it for hundreds of years, hundreds of years. You know, if you look look at sort of pamphlets from two hundred, three hundred years ago. You know, about joining the army or or plague or something. They've, they've always been done it. And that, that that question. What I what I figured was that mm -hmm. my experience working in Europe. Europe is a very much a a graphic kind of place, yeah, and they're very good. For, when you say Europe, you mean continental Europe as opposed to yeah. the UK, and, right? And they're very, they're very, very good at um, packaging things. So if you look at anything like the beer campaigns, like uh, like uh, Bières de la Muse by Mucha, you know, like in Austria, you know, turn of the century, lovely picture gives you the whole story, but it's just a picture, yeah, yeah, or even like, like a, or even like a Dubonnet poster, yeah, came on the side of a wall in Provence, yeah, some yeah. pictures, nice. It gets the idea. So they have some good art directors. That, no, yeah, but also it was more like window dressing. We present our product like Correct. this. Correct. Maybe that kind of person. Yeah. Okay, also, also had a fantastic uh, history from even from 1720, like the beginning of uh, um, uh, Daniel Defoe, who wrote Robinson Crusoe. Mm -hmm. Today, of like social realistic writing about life in general, yeah. Mm -hmm. But also from from that period onwards, they had a very strong. This is what I've, I've been deducing uh, uh, body of work for cartoons, you know, proper cartoons, not just people drawn with funny noses, but with captions. Okay, uh, like Hogarth and Gil Ray and people like that. They would mix pictures. With, with slogans or messages. captions, messages, yeah. I remember so, Roger did one on the on gene, you know, the, yeah, gene, the, the, the gene, like how gene can yeah. affect families yeah. and people yeah. 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 and pregnant yeah. women. It's a big, big exhibition in London about that. At the moment. Yeah, the tapes, and the, and, and, and what was being what was being done, was being done in Europe as well. So the. The yes, UK. okay, I agree with you, but somehow it's always more striking when you when you yeah. see the UK no, because it's just because like wow all... in your face, you know, they just like yeah. go for it. Yeah, so but... they'll take a picture, they'll take a picture, yeah, a caption or a caption of it. So it was a double whammy, you put two things together. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, and so you're saying it's a more realistic approach to life compared to the, to, the, to Europe, where it's a bit more well, rosy well, well, and well, 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 European was seduction rather than rather than attack. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Proposition. Yeah. America's yeah. all all proposition, no seduction. Yeah. And In America. Says, yeah. In America, it's like overloading. I mean, I listen yeah. to quite, quite a lot of YouTube YouTube yeah. videos, you know, to learn stuff about different subjects. Every time it's an American speaker, you have at the minimum five or six yeah. ads in a YouTube video of 15 minutes. It is unbearable. They just don't know when to stop the Americans. The, the, the lecture, they can't, they, can't, they can't paraphrase, they can't make it succinct. No, but they'd read really some ads as well in their own, uh, yeah, yeah, in their yeah, own yeah, yeah. Uh, content. So, yeah. so what you were saying, okay, so the UK would be more the message as well as, like, yeah. really impactful? That, that's what I like. So okay. even even it might have something quite bland, but the message, the words might be very strong, yeah? Yeah. Or witty or... Or, 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 or they'll use humour as well. Yeah. Or the, or, or the, uh, the, uh, the picture's strong and, the, and, and it's a caption. So one's a headline with a picture... Mm-hmm. Another one's a picture with a caption, yeah. Mm-hmm. And Europe, this pictures, America, it's just propositions. Yeah. Yeah? It's Euro- in Europe, that's true. It's, it's pictures, and as you were saying, it's more like um, um, a feel, a feel, a feel, an and also or trying an to an essence, a feel, and also trying to basically make the viewer feel good. While yeah. in the UK, they don't give a toss whether yeah. you feel good or not after seeing the ad. Yeah. They, they just want you to be marked by it. So I was yeah. like, wow, this is a different approach yeah. here. <laughs> But but I'll also I'll also do tackle subjects which are serious subjects with humour. You know, yeah. Do, yeah. So which most people thought, oh, this is too serious to be have everybody laughing. Mm-hmm. But they would do that for litter or road safety and stuff like that. Quite quite easy. What and in the UK? Yeah. Yeah. If that if that works, that's what works. What? Yeah. Yeah. Get, but get, I've get, noticed get. the Brits are extremely sensitive to humour, and me too. So yeah. that's that's a good fit. Yeah. <laughs> So that, that that's that's my my deduction. When I when I saw that 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 question, I thought, well, yeah. why is that? No, that? That's what I think it is. This yeah. is really something that struck me when I came to the UK and when I yeah. was really but, young. But also, you know, it's not just say Brits are good at everything. One thing that the Brits got from Europe was we had a very good lit- literature tradition yeah. and sure. newspaper. So they had a, a, a global newspaper uh, thing for a long, long time. You know. Even though Le Monde is called Le Monde, it's not only read in France, yeah, uh, sort yes, of. Yeah. That's right. Whereas the Times was written, read ev- everywhere, oh, everywhere in the world. Of course. So if you imagine Soho was next to Fleet Street, so you had people who were used to talk in the whole world, mm. and uh, and they were working cheek by jowl in each other's pockets all the time for hundreds of years. So, they were doing uh, what? Sorry? They're, they're working next door to each other. Oh, right, 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 yes. Uh, with each other for hundreds and hundreds of years. Yeah, and feeding so themselves to, ideas and bouncing back ideas. So they used to think of a big, uh, big concept around the world mm. all the mm. time. So they're, they're very good at handling big subjects. Yeah. And come, come in lots of different ways, yeah. Uh, Thanks for your, in, uh, for your, for your in, input and um, analysis on but, this. But what, what European advertising and some humor got, certainly in Europe, English advertising, what we got from, say, Europe was uh, the sort of 20th century uh, movements like uh, Dadaism, you know, something a bit weird. Well, people Dada? take a okay. dog, take a dog, surrealism, like McGreed, mm-hmm. etc. Oh, that's that's kind of weird. We'll use that as a for a cigarette ad, yeah, or or um, or uh, so Bauhaus style, you know, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. sort of u- unity. We'll, we'll use that kind of thing to make okay. propaganda points as opposed to just a, a picture, yeah? So the, uh, the various art and, and architectural and design movements which were coming from continental Europe. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. which we took and we thought we'll, your... use that, we'll use that out to make, send messages, yeah? Oh, okay, and, and you, we, were, we worked it the UK way. That's interesting. Yeah. Very, very interesting. Um, thanks. I mean, when I say it's interesting, it's uh, I, 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 what I mean is that um, I didn't know that. I didn't know actually that the UK also got, also got influenced by all these uh, yeah, movements. Of course um, yeah. So, thank you. Um, coming back to something a bit more cheerful after this okay. quite tough stuff about the AIDS campaign. Um, so, uh, if I remember well, you were born in the north of, of, of England, right? Yeah, no, I was born in Belgium actually. I was there for two years. It, where? Uh, Leuven in Belgium. In Belgium? How come? 
Like your mother then? My, my mother, mother and father, my father was an aero engineer. Yeah. Worked for Rolls Royce. And he met my mother in England and he moved around England. My brother was born in one part of the country, my sister and I, and I was born in Belgium. As, as he oh, moved you're the to, youngest of the three? Yeah. Yeah, okay. as, as, he, as he moved around to do it. Ah, okay. My, three, three was too young. His assignments after that were not in Europe. There were, then there were Peru, India, Papua New Guinea, all the other places. So my mother moved back to where she came from originally in the northeast. Very poor place, super, super poor place, yeah. So what's and, it called, uh, the place in the northeast? Uh, Blythe, Blythe in Blythe. Northumberland. Okay, in Northumberland, uh, okay. Yeah. Just, 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 just so do you have passport. a Belgian? Do you have a Belgian passport as well? I had one till I was seventeen, okay. and uh, and I know that because I was called up for the Belgian army, <laughs> <laughs> and it was all in Flemish. So I had to go in somewhere in Newcastle. I smoked the translate and said, "You've got a month to turn up to Belgium to be a soldier." And uh, they wanted to draft you. Gosh, no, no. But the funny thing, the funny thing was, and I mean, they wanted you to do the military service for sure. Yeah. Funny, funny thing is, I was only actually army cadets anyway. The English army cadets. Yeah, but uh, uh, so, yeah, at least you were really so, there. But so I thought, well, I was. Uh, I'd rather be in an English army. Let's put it that way. Yeah? I mean, I mean, and, and, the, and, the, Bel and the Belgian were just fighting it out in Congo at the time as well. Yeah. Oh gosh, you could you could have been all right, okay. Yeah, yeah. Could have been sent over there. Um, so I so I so, so try to make my, make make up mind whether to join. Obviously, I can't speak French or Bel uh, or Flemish, so I I, I just national nationalized the UK. Ah, okay. And so you you really quished the uh, the Belgium citizenship, and yeah. you okay, right? Um, I'm actually, you know, I, I have lots of things on my plate, but one of the things I, I think I may have to do in the future is to actually also, uh, of course, keep my French um, citizenship, but also take yeah. the UK one. Yeah. You, you know. I, I, I think I think you'll find that. I've got a lot of friends that have done that. Yeah. And, and I mean, got and, and annoying. There are some uh, stupid uh, tests to do and stuff, so it's time consuming. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I, know, I know people, a lot of people around here have done that. and uh, But I've got friends who... I've had to leave France, who've been there for 30 years, because it's so complicated to, to live in uh, France Provence, you know, like... In, what do you mean, like, in, uh, because of Brexit? To, to na no, to, no, to, to naturalise, to get... Become oh, French. right, yeah. Mm -hmm. It's really, really difficult. They've had a, uh, but I can tell you that the Home Office is not very easy as well at the yeah, moment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Anyway, so, so I, I know from both way, both sides. Yeah. So you were in Blythe from age two up until around what age? Eight, 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 Eighteen. Eight. Okay, and then you moved. You said to Manchester. Art College, Manchester Art College. Yeah, four years. And you did this fantastic, completely brand new course, which was in marketing. Yeah, yeah. Ad advertising. Ad oh, sorry, in for four years. Yeah, in, in art college in Britain, it's a four-year course. Any art college, <laughs> yeah. you do a yeah. foundation. You do a foundation course where you do all different things, awesome. illustration, printing, photography, model making, and then you specialize in a, a discipline, whether it's textiles, uh, uh, cinematography, graphics. And graphics is the area I went into, and they had a course for advertising there as well. Bachelor's degrees in France are also four years, as opposed yeah. to three yeah. in the UK. So, yeah. so. Yeah. Oh. And how come? And, 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 and it was in the university. It was a polytechnic, like the French okay. ones, where you actually have industry contacts. Yeah. Wow! Awesome. And so, and so, how do you explain that you were the only kid from probably a hundred um, from your school who actually went to university? How do you explain uh, that? Be because it was the it's probably the poorest area. And the no, poorest no. Area but what I mean is, why you? How, how did it come about for you? No, I think my brother went to university, my sister went oh. to university. Mm -hmm. yeah. But my year, I was the only one in, in my school, who we in the young school that went, went, went to. Uh, and I think it's because uh, my mother, he'd actually moved away from the place and moved to different parts of the country, and then she went to a place like Belgium. Uh, uh, she knew there's a different world out there. Yeah? Okay, so she went, She was so very keen she, on you. She, she, yeah, she, she, went, she went to grammar school till she was 14. She had to leave the school at 14 because her father, who was working in the mine, he got killed. And He was when, working where? In a mine, coal mine. In a mine? 
he got killed, which happens quite often. God. And, uh, in their, the mine? Yeah, the house of, yeah, the house that they lived in was a mining house. And uh, the family had two weeks to leave the house. But not only you leave the house, you leave behind you free coal, which would heat the house and would be able to cook on you. So they had to leave the house, spend temporary accommodation in other people's houses. And then the, the two kids weeks. took the kids, the parents without jobs and all that, no husband, a few other kids. Uh, she was sent off to Yorkshire first and then to, I think, another part of the country to be lodged with other people and get jobs. Oh, so she was separated from her mum and, and, and brothers? Yeah, but, but all, all the other kids did that. And the, and the mother was sent to, to London, as, uh, eventually to London. It was, it was, it was, it was, it was Dickensian. This is, this is only the 1950s. It was unbelievable, yeah. That was a pretty forceful hand. And who made all these decisions on behalf of your of your mum and the uh, and the family? Was that the social so, services? Was that no, no, the social service didn't, didn't really exist like that? Okay, it was just uh, like a matter of survival, and it yeah, had to yeah. be done that way, yeah. so yeah, everybody yeah. could have, uh, have something to 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 eat. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah. so but she was keen on on the three of you getting a higher yeah, education. Yeah, because she she wanted she wanted it when she was a kid wanted to be a higher educated person. Yeah. Uh, and she didn't have that chance. So she was yeah. my, my father. My father. After that, and I, I saw my father not that many times. Yeah, because he'd be away for three years at a time, all the time. And as I say, uh, I never had a Christmas with him. Never had a birthday. Never went on holiday ever. Had one holiday in my, my life when I was a kid, mm -hmm. and uh, that's how it was. But I wasn't the only kid like that in the area. Yeah, There's yeah, loads yeah. of people like that. Yeah. Yeah. My father also had another a couple of families elsewhere. I remember you mentioned that. Gosh, yeah. and it was that was that's how it was. Yeah, was that tough for you when you learned that? Uh, or you had already figured I, I, it out. I, I, I did. I didn't know the circumstances, but okay. I didn't look at my family. My, my sister was very bitter about all that. My brother and myself wasn't. Uh, my sister always felt abandoned. Oh. We just knew he was working in. In, uh, in the Amazon or he's in Papua New Guinea and all that, you know. So uh, he came back when he was old then to die. But uh, that's how I it was. That, yeah. And so your sister and yourself, you actually moved to London, but I remember your brother stayed behind, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, my sister only came for one year to do a teaching degree. Okay. And then, and then from our art college thing, then she went to Sheffield she met a, met a guy and then moved to Sheffield and became uh, our college teachers there. Oh, oh so she, yeah. she, she's there now. Okay. So you are the only one who actually um, came to the capital, I mean, to, uh, to London. And, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and to... Uh, yeah. But, you know, yeah, but it's a, it's a, it was always a very well-connected London and Newcastle. Yeah, okay. The coal industry, it was, it was a reciprocal thing. So okay. it was quite connected. Yeah. Good. Um... And so you said that from the age of 12 years old onwards, you wanted to work in the advertising business. Why yeah. that? What, how, how, did you get, how did you get that calling? Do you remember? Uh, I, I lived the, the town I lived in was filthy dirty. It was, uh, <laughs> it was just terrace houses. Blind. Uh, it was mine, yeah, mining, shipbuilding, ironworks, gas works. It was filthy dirty. Lots of stuff going on, yeah. And... Some of the small towns and villages around were either one or the other. So one would be a mining town, another one would be a shipyard town, or one would be a fishing town, yeah? Clive had a bit of everything. So when you get into about younger age, when you go to the big school, uh, they'd say to you, well, if you were in a mining town, that's it, you're going to be in a mine, yeah? But they'd say, well, you know, when you get understand what you're going to do, just tell one of your uncles what you want to do. You know, do you want to be a, a miner or do you want to be a shipyard person? Yeah, ah, and was that uh, options? <laughs> that, 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 that was sort of or, or join the army or something like that. Uh, and where we played, there's no grass, no trees, no nothing. Bottom of the mine at the top of the road, railway yards, docks, big wall at the bottom of the road where they're building ships, ships in the boat. And in front of the big wall at the bottom of the road. Uh, was a, a billboard, you know, like a poster site made out of wood. Yeah. 
and that was our that was our recreational playground. We used to go and climb on the back of it, look over the walls, and <laughs> that was that's where we played. And the whole place was just covered in suits and dirt and noise. But once once every month, people would come and put up these posters, clean posters on the wall, and it'd be for washing powders or whiskey or cigarettes or something like something really aspirational. And these guys would put up these posters as we watched. And when I was 12, I said to my mother, because uh, I knew I was artistic, my skill was art, art, art kind of things. Okay. And I uh, said to my mother, I said, oh, yeah, I know what I want to do now, you know, for a job, after this job. So, all right, okay, what do you want to do? Is it a mine or is it the shipyard? You know, which one's it going to be? I said, no, no, not the mine or the shipyard. The posters at the bottom of the road, I said, that's what I want to do. And my mother looked really disappointed. I said, what do you mean you want to do the poster? Look, she looked really disappointed. I said, well, she said, I, I don't think you can do that. I said, why not, Mum? She said, we, well, we don't know anybody with a ladder. You can't take a ladder. <laughs> and I said, no, Mum, not put them up. Think them up. I said, well, That's why she was disappointed. Because <laughs> she, she thought you wanted to actually go and place them there. Yeah, yeah. And I... By that time, I'd worked out these images were coming from somewhere where life's better, and there's somebody not only printing them, uh, there's somebody actually imagining these things and making them they're there, and the whole everybody looks at them and admires them. And that's like this 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 whole world out there, yeah. And that's that's what I want to do. And then I worked out, still being because it's a poor place that there was such a thing as a. a, a a commercial artist. There's artists who paint pictures, but there's commercial artists who do picturey stuff for money. Yeah. Yeah. For oh, commercial artists. Was she relieved, your mum, when you explained that you didn't want to be actually the guy who was placing the ads on the ladder, but you actually yeah. wanted to make the ads? The yeah. Uh, but no, eventually work with that work there. You know, work, work there. There must be people like that. Yeah. Ah. And then yeah. And so then, that's, and then she came around. Oh, that's good. Yeah. Actually, you know what? It's funny because I also. Oh, but, 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 but my, my aunt. Yeah. My aunt, I'll just say this. Even though I went there, I went to art college and uh, I was successfully back in London making big, big, big deal commercials and stuff. Yeah. One, one that was your, your mother's sister? Oh, my, my family. It's a, it's a very working class socialist place, yeah? And this was the 70s, 60s, 70s. Margaret Thatcher just cut, closed all the mines and stuff then. And uh, I, went, I was at the funeral with one of my elderly aunts. Okay. And at the time, I had a big advertising campaign, which I created in London. Okay. But was running, running in the northeast for a northeast beer called McEwan's Best Scotch. It was all about returning Geordies, people like me, traveling from all around the world, go back for this particular beer. And it was a very famous campaign, uh, and everybody liked it. And the football crowds would shout, sing it, all and that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, you must my auntie was all, my auntie was very indifferent to me, I would say. And she said, Oh, I hear you're doing well. And, you know, you're in London doing all that, you know, and you're doing the one with the beer with the guy does this. And I go, Yeah, 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 that's me. I did that. I said, Advertise. And I said, Yes, I said, that. And she said, I always knew you'd turn out rotten. You turn up what? Rotten, bad. <laughs> well, because you were was making it? money. I was making advertising, yeah. And advertising was like the devil. Was it? Yeah, that was, it was seen as really bad. Things it's interesting do. that you actually saw it as the way out, but not yeah. not not for ninety nine percent of the rest of your. Yeah. yeah. On this note, actually, um, I also decided to become a. Uh, I mean, I've, I've made the choice of my career when I was 12 as well. Uh, yeah. I don't know why, but I decided that at that age I wanted to become a lawyer. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, although there were no lawyers in my family, um, but yeah. Um, yeah, that's when I decided. So, last question, but not last. Well, I'll cut past you. The last thing that we watch really well to explain how the law works in France, I mean, this is, this is litigation law, was watching Spiral. Spiral. What is this? Spiral. It's a, it's, it was a, it was a big series about legal people in uh, in uh, legal in the police in uh, Paris. Is that a French series? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I still don't have a TV set, so. Okay, okay. 
Okay, I'll Google it. I'll Google it. Thank Spiral. you. Spiral. Although, I, yeah, I've been in this business for 20 years, but thanks. I'll <laughs> Google it nonetheless. Yeah. Um, so as I was saying, last but not least, um, with all your expertise and, um, and you having worked for such a long time in this advertising industry, how, how, uh, what di direction do you think the business is taking at the moment, um, especially with the digital world slowly replacing most other types of media, in particular TV, radio? Um, well, I, th I think what's, happened, what's happening in, is uh, advertising's disappeared now. It's just not, not doesn't, doesn't count. Okay. Uh, John Egerty just did an article some, somewhere recently and said it's lost its swagger because it's swagger. not important. It's not important anymore. It's just stuff. Yeah. Okay. And I think all, all this digital world is about. Well, I'm sorry, but I don't think the, 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 this message has actually. But I don't think the penny has dropped in the US. I mean, I never ever watch the t TV in the US because if you are watching a film, you are going to be bombarded yeah. with. Oh, no, 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 no. What, what I mean, good effort. Good, good advertising is dead. Ah, good advertising. Okay, like relevant Stop. and smart and witty. Yes. Okay, yeah. very that, nice. That's all. The stuff okay. is still going to happen. Okay. Um, and it'll drunk, happen in a as in drunk. <laughs> yeah, it'll, it'll, it'll uh, happen in the digital world. Okay. And it'll, it'll find out where you are and inhabit your space and just try to be, you know, advocate for their product or service. And just find find that where you are because you, you you've got a you got a map of where you what you're watching and what you're doing and all that. And just, or what you like as well, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. yeah so all that kind of stuff. And some of the stuff you like, some you go on, and it's and the, the stuff that's sort of half interest and that's amusing like that. Or people who are just doing like TikTok ads where they just do something silly and. Uh, and then it's sponsored by a sponsor. It's like sponsorship as opposed to propaganda. Proper, proper, yeah. There's no propaganda okay. anymore. Uh, okay. So there's no place for great advertising. There's some place for creative people to make new creative products and goods and services. And that's why I tell everybody is think of something that you like, do it, uh, and you'll have the skills to make it happen. Yeah, because now, now, very ordinary people can make something that's that that can happen and uh, and will be able to be made or done or served or used, yeah. Unless you need a lot of money, but there's ways to, to, to do that as well. Okay, in a way which is quite cheap and still quite efficient. And, and yeah, you can do that, or, or you can build it up, you know. Uh, but I always say to people, when you do start a new goods or service or a product, ask yourself, do you want to do this for the rest of your life? If, you, if you're based on, I want to do things with sheep's milk. Mm -hmm. That's uh, my whole life will be will keep it small because we make it big. People come and take that from you. You know, just just do it for yourself. Yeah. Or whatever you do, whether it's a new packaging system or an app or something, like that, you may think you're going to be Elon Musk, but in fact, Elon Musk will come to you and say, "I, I want to buy that because it's cheaper for him to just buy it off you mm -hmm. and uh, and get rid of get the idea behind that and get rid of the opposition." So. Right from the get go, so you have to be a serial thinker up there, because you'll you'll think of something up. What price will you bow out? Mm -hmm. uh, take it because these guys have got more money than you'll ever have. They they've got the money already, <laughs> uh, and so you're just there, you're just their R R and D department. You may think it's your idea, your world, but in fact you're the R and D department for the super rich. If you know what I mean, yeah. If they like it, they'll take it. Okay, so uh, but, yeah, summarize. But, but, but with but, but with that kind of designy advertising stuff, if you know that, you can actually use that to your advantage. Make make something famous quickly, mm -hmm. and people you get people's attention. They'll come and buy it, and you can make some money out of it. And, and move on to the next thing, right? Yeah. Okay, so that's uh, that's much more short short termism than before. Then I suppose. Well, I know, do, do you, well, it's just like us in advertising, work on a campaign for two years, and then you've got the next one, you know, yeah, it's just, yeah. we, we had that great ability to work on insurance and beauty and then cars and beers yeah, and yeah, travel. Yeah. We're, we're very, this is what I like, 
This is what I like about having your law firm, you you know, and managing a business like this, that you yeah. can get clients on different yeah. type of yeah. uh, industries and topics yeah. all the time. And that, well, I mean, when there's not a recession, obviously, like in, at the yeah. moment, <laughs> but then it's great because then exactly then you move on to the next client or the next project. Yeah. That's I like this sort of. Um, and you learn, you learn the peculiarities of that thing, and that's something yeah. that works. And yeah. somewhere else, yeah. but then you never get bored because you're yeah. always learning new stuff. So that's that's what yeah. I like. Yeah. Great. Well, thank you so much for being so generous okay. with your information, your time, okay. your ideas, your yeah. Uh, yeah, and 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 stuff about about you know your trajectory in the uh, in the advertising world. It was great to uh, to hear all about you. So yeah. thank you, Malcolm. Thank you. Cool. Thanks. Okay. Yes. Thanks, Samuel. Hope to see you on this side of the. Absolutely. Back in terra firma whenever I can because I'm dying to come back to London. Yeah. Bye, Malcolm. Bye, -bye. Bye again. Bye. Bye, Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye, Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you for listening to our podcast, Lawfully Creative, produced by Preferred Studios. Subscribe to our podcast and catch up with our original shows on iTunes, Spotify, Deezer, Stitcher, YouTube, Anchor and many more podcast aggregators and platforms. Please leave a review and rating about our podcast to encourage others to discover our curated content. Thank you.